ladies and gentlemen, we are live! As this is the main event you've all been waiting for! Brought to you by Exodius, the cybersecurity asset management company. It's time! Hello and welcome to another episode of Cloud Security Podcast with Virtual Coffee with Ashish. And this month is Cloud Native Security Month. And we're talking about all things cloud native this month. And I have my first topic, which is observability plus over here. Over here. For those who are joining us for the first time, uh, this is a weekly episode. Well, I guess Cloud Security Podcast is a weekly episode, which we go live here every week on different topics of cloud security. And this is where we get to hang out with other people and talk about cloud native security today. So I've got a special guest today, uh, and I've got a special music queued in for this gentleman. Uh, let me uh, get my music app here, and let's get it rolling. Hey, welcome, Chad. Hey, how's it, Ashish? Good, man, good. Thanks for coming in, man. I really appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome. Uh, I was going to say, with the, um, the, the tradition with watching coffee with Ashish, we, we do visit a coffee mug. So what you, did you get your drink, man? I did, right here. Uh, cheers. Thanks for coming in, man. Cheers. Uh, wait, what, what time is it for you, making sure you... <laughs> oh, it's like uh, 3 p.m. over here in Portland, Oregon. All right. Okay. So you can still have coffee. That's good. You can still have yeah. coffee. Yeah. It, it's, no it's not going to be bad. I, I would not feel bad making you drink coffee <laughs> at like seven in the night or something. Yeah. So I would do appreciate that. Yeah. Um. Say so I've known, uh, I guess, of, of you for some time, but a lot of people may not have heard of you. So for people who may not know who Chad Young is, if you could just give us a brief intro about yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I've done all kinds of things in the past, um, but I got really interested in observability. Um, well, I've always been interested in it from the perspective of uh, operating big systems, but I was working on a project called Cloud Foundry, um, building the uh, container uh, scheduler, sort of the runtime that managed uh, all the containers that Cloud Foundry uh, manages. And uh, just hit kind of like a, a breaking point where I felt like the traditional tools that we were using to observe systems were just like not not sufficient enough uh, for the situation that we were in and started researching it more, uh, which is how I got into distributed tracing and some of these other tools. And then that led to the open tracing project and then the open telemetry project. And I went to work at a company called Lightstep uh, which is founded by a guy named Ben Siegelman, who wrote a lot of the white papers and some of the original tracing systems they were using over at Google. Uh, so I've been uh, kind of in the distributed tracing observability world full time for about five years now. Right. Uh, so I'm, I'm glad because we're going to get into all of this in a minute as well. So for people who don't even know, maybe we should start with cl cloud native first. What sure. does cloud native mean for you? Oh, geez. Uh, buzzword central. Uh, for, <laughs> for, me, for me, I think the term cloud native comes from the idea that uh, we're now running in rented hardware, right? Where you're, you're in this world where it's very easy to spin up servers. It's very easy to, to connect them together and at the same time, we're running larger and larger, more complicated systems than we, we have in the past. And so cloud native is sort of like, how do we take uh, our traditional tool stack and, and modify and adjust it to, to make our life easier in this, this new world? So when I started, we were racking servers. So I, I'm old enough, sadly, uh, that I, when, when we started, it, it, was, um, it wasn't about scaling, it was about um, capacity management, right? Where you had to figure out ahead of time what kind of capacity you were going to need uh, because you had to have those machines. If, if you didn't have the machines, it was gonna take weeks to, to order new ones and get them installed. So it was about capacity management. And 
one of the the big shifts was uh, when we shifted towards uh, renting renting hardware and being able to just spin them up like that. You, it starts to change uh, your thinking, and as the number of machines you're running scales up and up and up to the point where you're no longer really being able to do traditional system administration where you're kind of like logging in, you're setting them all up by hand and doing all of that. You need to kind of, those two things kind of went hand in hand. There were like advantages from being able to spin up lots of machines, but then there was the fact that you weren't going to be able to sort of manage them by hand. I've heard the the, the phrase like, um, you know, cattle, not, not pets um, as, as a way of describing the, the shift that I think is accurate. Um, so to me, cloud native is like all of the, the technology that is now grown up around uh, making making life easier in this new world of, of rented hardware. So, so that actually is a good definition because uh, we have been talking about cloud and what cloud has been for some for some time mm -hmm. on this cloud security podcast as well. And now we're at that stage, we are almost talking about that next evolution that's going on in the cloud space where Hey, it's no longer enough just to have hardware that, I mean, I, I guess, you know how, um, I, I guess I, my, uh, the way I explain it is like, they used to be carts, then they used yeah. to be cars. You, I can't imagine a world going back to a cart again. And I feel mm -hmm. like cloud native is kind of similar where uh, people have gone to the point that they know, oh, I can get a hardware in a matter of minutes. I'm not going to wait three months or four months for hardware. But now people are taking that for granted and going for that next level. Okay. Uh, I just want all these features. I don't care about the hardware anymore. And I think exactly. that's how I came across the observability piece. So how does observability fit into this? Is, and if you don't mind me asking. Yeah, so I mean, uh, observability comes from the fact that we still have bugs. Uh, we still have to operate our machines, the machines. Uh, it comes down to, to my mind, like two main problems. There are logical errors, so you've coded the uh, computer programs to do something that isn't what you expected uh, them to be doing. And the other is a uh, resource contention. Uh, when you run this at scale, uh, there's something about the interplay between uh, the request for resources, the availability of resources, the concurrent access to all of these resources that creates its own trouble. And that's so observability is the ability to actually uh, see what's happening in real time and be able to tease out um, when uh, an invariance is being violated. In other words, something that you expect to happen is not happening, it's like a logical error. And the other is, is resource contention when um, uh, you have insufficient or mismatched resources and things are starting to go wrong due to um, due to resource utilization. Okay, and to your point, at that point, you you would need this, because if you're still having bugs and because we're still talking about, hey, what, yeah. I mean, I need to somehow figure out a way to manage this, monitor this. So is the same as logging? Yeah, uh, well, it's yes and no. So we, we still do the same thing that we always did, which is when you wanna know what what's wrong with your system, or you want to know what your system's doing, there are events. So what, what are the sequence of events that were occurring when a program was executing? And observing those events, we tend to call logs. And then we want to know what's happening in aggregate, right? We want to be able to step back and say, in aggregate, what's happening? And this is where we're looking at resource contention and, and problems of that nature. So we tend to call that metrics traditionally. So you have logs and metrics. Yep. Oh, actually, so that's an interesting point because every time I've spoken about logging in general, it's always been about, hey, what data source am I getting my information from? You suck all that information out and then you, you develop some kind of metrics from it. So are we, are we saying <laughs> that that's obsolete now? Well, uh, the problem runs into, that you run into is really a problem of, of indexing. So when you're saying like, go look at the logs, well, what logs? So let's say you have a transaction and you've, you've got an exception over here and you wanna find out what's causing that exce exception. 
one of the first things you're going to want to do is say, well, get me the rest of the logs that were in that transaction. And I think anyone who has operated a system that was doing more than processing one request at a time knows it's actually really painful to collect up those logs because on any given machine, there are a bunch of concurrent requests. So there's all these logs happening at once. And you want to know, well, which of these logs were just part of this particular request? And then you've got the fact that these transactions are distributed. So this request was going from one machine to another machine to another machine to another machine. So you've got 50 machines and this request touched six of them. So that problem is now repeated across 50 machines. You want to find the logs that are just in this one transaction. And if you don't have any kind of indexing, like if there's no way to say like, well, I found this log, so I just want to look up all the other logs that are in this transaction, that becomes this sort of manual um, just grepping around uh, or whatever logging system you're using, you're, you end up doing a lot of searching and filtering to, to just get that collection of logs that represents a particular transaction. And that actually takes a lot of time. It's time people have gotten so used to spending that you, you may have kind of forgotten how much time you're spending doing that. But if you, the next time you're, to anyone listening, the next time you're investigating an issue, just, just notice, like, like stopwatch something, notice how much time you're spending just collecting the information so that you can look at it as opposed to making it a hypothesis and actually operating on that information. So that's, that's what's starting to fall apart with, with logs. Interesting. Uh, so, so, so I imagine all the security operation people listening to this who ask everyone, hey, throw all your logs into the theme collector, which is like basically a log aggregator yeah. and going because that's, that's our log aggregator. And I, I guess all your cloud service providers shall use the same as well. Hey, push all your logs into this cloud watch for AWS or whatever. But sure. there's no, it just logs and metrics at that point. But there's no, like, to your point, if the, I'm, I'm just hy hypothesizing a scenario where it does an issue with an application, you go into, say, in the AWS scenario, you go to CloudWatch, then you have a bunch of logs, and you're going, okay, timeline. Then you go into what, uh, is this just the log of the application, or is there other things in there as well? I mean, you can keep exactly. dissecting that for hours. Yeah, and so really, truly, the only difference between logging and tracing is, let's even assume you're using a logging system that has indexing. It's a proper database, so you can index these logs so you can look them up. But the index that you're going to want is what's called a trace ID or a transaction ID. You're going to want an, a unique identifier. So when that transaction starts on the client, an identifier is generated, and then every log in that transaction gets that same identifier. Even if it hops to another machine, that identifier follows it. So you just have this identifier attached to every log. And if you've got that ID and you've got a database you're storing the logs in that does indexing, then when you find one log, it's going to have that ID on it. And then you just look up by ID and bam, you've got all the other logs. And so as, as soon as you add that, that transaction ID, uh, you're now doing tracing. That's it's fundamental. That's that's all tracing is. There's a bunch of other stuff people add uh, to tracing once you once you're doing that. But at its fundamental, it's just about getting that that key identifier attached to every log. The trick right. is, it's a lot of work to to I do that. Say, your, your traditional you, logging tool lacks the kind of context in order to to do that. It's just like make me a log right here, and there's no that log when you make it is not contextualized. And so actually adding, adding that context, uh, so there's uh, all of your code is now executing in a context that contains this transaction ID uh, is, is a fair amount of work. And that's why tracing systems require more work to build. Uh, they require more work to set up uh, than a traditional logging logging system. But that's the main difference is having that idea. So I may have jumped a few a few uh, steps here. Then, just if you if you were to bring it back to the beginning, so I've got people mm -hmm. who may be going, well, I've been log aggregating for such a long time. Mm -hmm. I've got logging. I've got metrics. That seems to work. But we, what we are saying at the moment that takes enormous amount of time and a lot of times does not even have context. 
And yeah. we need to go down the path of uh, indexing with context so yes. that we at least at the, the time to getting to the problem so you can work on the trade away should be shorter. Would that exactly. be the right summarization? That, that's correct. Sorry, my, my cat's hungry. It's the debut of an animal of my show, so <laughs> I, I love it. Um, yeah. Also, is this where is it. comes in as well? Yeah. So um, if you're going to be uh, if you're going to be tracing, you have to be generating these events, and that's that's no different than logging. Um, so you do need to, to instrument your code. Uh, this is maybe another area where Open Telemetry, the particular project I'm working on, has a, a specialty, which is most software systems today are actually written out of third-party software. So you're taking a lot of usually open source libraries today and you're you're bringing them together. Uh, come on. <laughs> uh, you're, you're taking um, a lot of third-party libraries and you're gluing them together and then applying your application logic on top of that. You're not writing your own HTTP client, your own database client. You're not writing your own web framework. You're, you're taking these off-the-shelf components and you're reusing them and fashioning them into an application. So you have these third-party libraries that are doing uh, a lot of the heavy lifting for you. And one thing for anyone who's attempted to, to write open source software, I've written a fair bit of it myself, you hit this wall where you want to instrument your library so that you can provide the users of your library with information about what it's doing. But you can't because you have this issue with composition where it, I can pick a logging library, a tracing library, a metrics library, but if I pick one that's different from the one the application owner wants to use or is different from the one all the other libraries pick, then it's not going to compose into a coherent system. And so you end up um, just kind of like spewing logs to standard out or giving someone like a hook and being like, you, you wire all this up. And so that, that's always been a bummer. So besides integrating everything with tracing and providing better indexing and, and just fundamentally better observability, open telemetry is also split out and architected in such a way that um, third-party libraries can instrument themselves with open telemetry without taking on dependencies or overhead or limiting the application owner uh, in ways uh, there's certain choices the application owner needs to make and open telemetry kind of divides out how it's set up so that you the instrumentation is not making choices about say where you're sending the data or what format the data is coming out in um, so so we're hoping to solve this problem of native instrumentation as well as the problem of, of distributed tracing and getting everything integrated also oh, so when you say native native instrumentation would just be um logs provided by the provider like exactly exactly yeah. so if i'm writing um uh, a web framework or, or a database client uh i should be able to provide the instrumentation myself and uh i am the person as the as the, the author of that software the person who knows what's important i know what my users need to know about what the system's doing and i also know the remediations Right. So if I'm writing my own instrumentation, that means I can also start doing some good DevOps practices like shipping playbooks, saying uh, Couchbase is an example, a company that's that's doing this. So they natively instrumented with open tracing and now open telemetry. And then they ship a playbook that says we're producing these logs and metrics around things like, you know, how back the, the queue is. And so if you see this warning or you're seeing these thresholds getting breached, uh, that means you need to tune these parameters. So here's our playbook for what the information is that's coming out of the system and also what you should do about it when you see it. Like here's how you should tune things or here's what it means when you're seeing uh, seeing this information we're providing you. Oh, and uh, so to your point, uh, maybe, maybe we should explain what open telemetry is because we, sure. you and I have some understanding or at least you have more understanding than I do. But yeah. Uh, it, uh, we should probably define what open telemetry is because we, we're using the word, but a lot of people are like, what the hell is it? So yeah, what is open yeah, telemetry? Absolutely. So open telemetry is an open source project. It's uh, under the aegis of the CNCF. And it 
combines, it provides instrumentation for every major form of observability, tracing, metrics, logs, um, things like eBPF uh, are going to get added to it, uh, RUM. Uh, so it's just going to be, be a catch-all for all the different ways you might want to instrument a system. But it does it in a way that's novel by using distributed tracing as the underpinning to actually take what were traditionally considered several different pillars or several different tools um, and ensures that they're all cross-indexed so that you can get a single cross-index stream of data coming out of your system. And this solves some of the problems we were talking about earlier about how it's normally really slow to move between these tools because you don't have the you don't have the indexing, so you can't write databases or um, automated analysis tools because the data is not actually uh, there. With open telemetry, all of this stuff is getting cross-indexed. So, uh, in the future, once this project is is complete and widely adopted, I think you're actually going to see a shift in the kind of observability products and tools people are offering going away from you have your metrics dashboards over here and you have your logging system over here and your tracing system over there to something that's more like one coherent system that's that's synthesizing all of these different data sources to give you like a more complete picture that you can move around between a lot easier. Oh, I, I, actually, that reminded me, because um, Amazon recently made, mm -hmm. I think it was Grafana, I think they made available through open telemetry or something like that. So basically, they, I think my, my understanding from that news was they started supporting uh, open telemetry standards, I guess, language in some of their, well, at least one of their products. Yes. Uh, is, people can utilize that. So there's, there's a couple of different pieces if we're going to break open telemetry down. So there's the instrumentation part, which we call the APIs. Yep. And the APIs are totally decoupled from any implementation. So when you're instrumenting your code or your service using open telemetry APIs, uh, there's no imp implementation getting hauled in. Um, this actually relates to security and, and other uh, things around dependencies. I should say there's no dependency chain that yep. automatically comes in just because you've instrumented, which is a key element when it comes to instrumenting open source libraries. But you've got your API. Then you have what's called the SDK, which is an implementation we provide that you would install in your application. And the SDK is where you're configuring what you're doing with that data, where you're sending it, what format uh, it's going to be in. Um, we support a wide variety of existing formats for this stuff. But then there's the open telemetry protocol called OTLP. That format is special because that's the format that actually takes all these different data sources and combines it into a single stream. So you're just fire hosing OTLP at some endpoint that can then take all of these different data types and do something coherent with them. And then along the way, there's a service we provide called the collector and the collector is like a data processing service. Uh, and that's so that you can move a lot of the, the data processing and configuration work out of your application services. And you instead move it over to the separate service you're running called a collector. And so that's where you would be doing things like scrubbing your data, PII, um, converting between data formats, um, being able to do things like say, generate metrics out of your tracing data, right? So generating metrics on the fly, things of that nature. And um, you can also use this to then tee off into multiple uh, data syncs. So if you want to send your data to, let's say CloudWatch, but, and also Datadog, or let's say someone's written a, a specialized analysis tool. And so you want to send some of the data off over that, you can actually send data off to to, to multiple places using the collector. Uh, the one thing open telemetry doesn't provide is any kind of database or backend or analysis tool. And that's because the project is focused on standardizing the telemetry portion of this system. So we, we help people generate the data and then transmit it. But, and that's where we're trying to get all the agreement happening and standardization, but we don't want to get into the the analysis of the database game, because that's kind of where all the competition and all of the 
the kind of greenfield revolution is going on. So we, 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 we the, the edge of the project ends there uh, at the collector sending data off to some third party service. All right. Okay. So open telemetry is that, I guess, for lack of a better word, instrument that's standardizing yes, logging exactly. across multiple sources. Yeah. So the term, that's why we chose the term telemetry, open telemetry. Because if you look up telemetry, it's the generation of and transmission of uh, metrics and data about some remotely operated system. So it's not the analysis part, it's just the generation and the transmission of the data. And so right. we're seeing um, uh, um, infrastructure providers like Amazon, Google, Microsoft all start to integrate open telemetry into the services they're running on customers' behalf so that when customers are are doing tracing of their applications and then they're talking to say you know an amazon service like s3 or you know application gateway or something like that um that trace is continuing on into that that service that they're running and then they're going to provide those users with otlp data of their requests when it hit those services so that's another place besides open source libraries, you have these managed services that in the past, it was difficult to get any information out of, but now with open telemetry, um, you're gonna get all of this, this great uh, OTLP data starting to come from. That would be a game changer providers. for a lot of people as well, especially mm -hmm. the folks yeah. who were asking in the beginning, hey, is cloud secure? I can't see anything in the cloud. How do I trust this? Mm -hmm. But now uh, through open telemetry, and I, it's really interesting. What, I'm curious, are there enough people, uh, I guess, behind this? Is that why such popularity? Because if the managed service providers have started, like the Amazon, Google, Microsoft of the world have started providing this, is it like, is it mainstream? Yeah, so it's definitely backed by um, uh, all the major players in the industry. So part of the idea here was that this is only going to work if we all come together and agree on a standard. Um, especially when you're talking about distributed tracing, right? Where you're trying to pass these transaction IDs around and have some kind of coherent view of the entire um, transaction. You, you have to have agreement on how you're gonna do that. And so the open telemetry project um, came out of, there were initially kind of two competing projects that were in a similar space. There was open tracing which is happening in the CNCF. And then there was something called the Open Census Project that was happening at Google. And it was quickly clear, like this just wasn't gonna work if, like there are other domains where, yeah, you can have a bunch of different databases and it's fine. But this particular domain, because it was about interoperation, we needed to actually all come together. So open telemetry actually represents everyone in the industry coming together to, to work on the same project. So you've got, me at Lightstep uh, and uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Splunk, um, uh, as some of the founding members, New Relic, Dynatrace, Honeycomb, uh, a lot of observability vendors showing up in the early days. Uh, so it's it's got a lot of legs at this point, and it's it's seen a, a quite a quite a bit of adoption already. Uh, even though the, I should mention the project is not completed. Uh, the tracing portion is stable, but metrics and logs are, aren't, uh, aren't stable yet. Uh, we're hoping for metrics to be stable end of year. And oh, uh, I should you, you explain can, why, what do you mean by not stable? People might think it's, it's going to explode. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, um, we care quite a bit about stability. Uh, it's really common in the world of open source for people to declare something 1.0 and then ship a 2.0 like the next year and be like, ah, it's an improvement. It broke everything, but it's an improvement. And we're very, very sensitive to that because instrumentation goes everywhere, right? We're looking at these instrumentation APIs with the expectation, the expectation that there's going to be millions and millions of lines of code written against these instrumentation APIs. So stability for us means we never break it ever, right? Microsoft wants to put this into Office and Windows. So we're talking about software that has a shelf life measured in decades. So that's yeah. the kind of long-term 
we're thinking about is that like when we say open telemetry is stable, we're saying this API is never going to break. It's going to be supported like basically for the lifespan of this project, however long that is. Um, and we already did this with open tracing. So for example, we had the open tracing APIs. And then when we went to open telemetry, we made improved APIs. So sort of like a V2 of open tracing, but all the open tracing APIs still work. Everything interoperates with open tracing. So um, we didn't break anybody's code by, by switching to open telemetry. So that's what we mean by stable. So tracing at open telemetry is stable and it's yeah. going to remain stable forever. And so you can trust that if you're instrumenting with that, we might add improvements in the future that might make things easier for people or add additional features, but the, the code you write is never going to stop working. And we are not there yet for metrics. Um, we're there for logs in the sense that if the logging you're doing is on traces, so if it's like yeah. just logging against your traces, we call those span events. That's there. That's fine. I recommend people use that as their main logging API today. But you have all these kind of like edge cases around logging that aren't really covered by that. And that's that's not there yet. Okay. With met with metrics, the problem is like the the metric space is like very, very broad. And we want to make sure that the metrics APIs we're building works with like it works for we want it to be something that would work for Prometheus. Um, we want it to be something that works for Stats D. Uh, for all the, the things people are currently doing. And we also want to make sure that it's doing things that systems don't do, which is integrate with tracing so that your metrics dashboards are actually connected up to your tracing and logging system, which is another thing that's actually really awkward and annoying today, oh, which right. is you, you look at your metrics dashboards and you can see there's a spike, like, oh, there's a big spike in errors. But what are these errors? What was causing these errors? You you can't just like click on that dashboard and then go look at example logs and traces of the things that were generating that dashboard because it's two totally separate systems right now. And yeah. so with open telemetry, those things are getting combined so that the data you're receiving, whether your system today supports it or not, the data is cross-indexed. So when you see those metrics, those mm -hmm. metrics are coming in with trace exemplars attached to them so that future systems are going to be able to just say like, yeah, so this slowness you're seeing here, here's example transactions that represent these errors or this slowness or these HTTP 500, whatever it is you're looking at in the dashboard. So right. getting all of that working and making sure that it's, it's, it's like final, final working well, uh, we're hoping to hit that for for metrics by end of year. So that's awesome. that's our current goal. Yeah. That's, uh, well, uh, I'm sure a lot of people would, would be looking forward to this as well. But I'm sure a lot of people are also excited now. They've basically heard about open telemetry mm -hmm. from you, observability from you. So if they want to go down this path of, they obviously a lot of people would already be doing a lot of logging, a lot of metrics already. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's in their own way, and as you said. They have, everyone has a dashboard, every operation person, DevOps person, they'll have a dashboard for, hey, this is how my application is behaving. And they definitely cannot click on that link. They'll, it'll just take them to another rabbit hole, I guess, where mm -hmm, you can mm -hmm. click on a link. Um, if we were to start today on this, as anyone listening to this wants to start today on this, what's the easiest way to, because I, I imagine there's a, big transition from shifting from just doing logging and metrics, suddenly doing open telemetry because there needs to be a, pro a provider available as well. Or is, is there too much, like, is, would you pick one over the other if you're starting today? Um, so there's uh, open telemetry works with, with all the major providers. Uh, if someone wants to start today, uh, you just want to go ahead and get the open telemetry SDK installed and start using that for tracing. That's the hardest part to set up is, is getting your traces, sorry, propagated across all of your services. Because metrics and logs, they're kind of like these single point contextless things. That also makes it like easy to set up. When you set up tracing, uh, there's a little bit of superstructure that has to get set up properly so that the traces actually propagate. Um, that means installing the open telemetry SDK 
installing instrumentation for um, the major libraries you're using, especially the network libraries, like your, your web server and your HTTP clients that are talking to each other, that needs to have instrumentation installed so that the traces propagate. So that's that's like still a little bit of a, um, a, a little bit of work sometimes to, to get started with. We're trying to, to make that a lot smoother as things become more and more natively instrumented, that'll naturally get a lot smoother. Um, but that's, that's where people want to start. Once you have tracing set up end to end, so you can see traces, then you can start doing things like say, converting your existing logs into span events. Um, or you can take your trace data and use it to start decorating your logs. So once you have tracing set up, you now have a trace ID and a span ID. And most existing logging tools have something called like a log appender. So just creating a little adapter that takes that trace information and staples it onto a log every time you make it, even without changing tools, just using your existing logging tool, having those trace IDs on there are going to really improve your day because now like almost every blogging tool has some way that lets you search and filter. And so you could start searching and filtering using trace IDs uh, once you get open telemetry installed. So that's like an easy way to get started. And likewise, um, uh, the, the metrics and trace data uh, that you get out of open telemetry can be sent off to any backend. So whatever backend you're currently using can start receiving data from open telemetry instrumentation. So it's possible to progressively migrate off of your, your existing tools and just, just keep the portion of your existing tools that are still useful to you once you've installed uh, open telemetry. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Um, so to, uh, I, I guess, a lot of security people listening to this may already be in observability platforms. They may not have adopted it, but they see it around in their, um, I guess, personal work life at the moment. I well, mm -hmm. personal professional work life, I guess. But oh, clearly, there's some security risk to observability as well that people should consider. And mm -hmm. uh, in saying this, understand it's a bit new. So not everyone out on the internet is using observability, but there's a plan for it eventually go down that path. So from Keeping that in mind, what are some of the obvious security risks that, say, someone who's a security architect going, or we're deploying observability now? Well, what yeah. what am I looking for here? Like, what well, what are some of the low hanging fruit, for lack of a better word, uh, that they should be uh, asking questions about? Yeah. So um, observability has the same security risks that all open source libraries have, which is you're taking this third party dependency that you didn't write, and then you're installing it on every single service that you're running. And so that is that is a juicy target, right? Uh, so this is what's called a supply chain attack. And this is an area where I think open source really has some growing up to do, right? Like open source has this sort of like free for all background where we're just creating stuff and sharing it widely. And it's all very just like chaotic and organic. And there's like lots of great stuff happening. But one thing that's not good there is security. So uh, in a world where it was just, just, you know, cowboys doing this on the side, that wasn't a real target. But now that these libraries are getting deployed, into big enterprises and the federal government, the military and all other places, you're starting to see them get targeted. Uh, solar winds is like the huge, huge example here. Um, the solar winds hack was, you know, basically hacking an observability tool, right? This is a network monitoring tool that was installed everywhere. And uh, hackers were able to get a um, tainted dependency uh, baked into that tool. So when that tool got installed, uh, their um, malware got installed along with it. So that's a problem that we take very seriously in open telemetry. That's why we look at um, dependency chains uh, really seriously. And we're trying to take a hard look at um, how on the one hand we can say, here is 
here is a subset of things we provide that we have some security guarantees about. And then beyond that, here's sort of like the general ecosystem of plugins and instrumentation and things people have written uh, for open telemetry that you can install, but we, we can't make any real guarantees about, you know, where, where they're coming from or, or whether you should install them. And so, so I think that's, that, that's a real problem that open telemetry has to face that, um, honestly though, no different than the problem your, your web framework is facing or any yeah. other, uh, widely. Like, so data yeah, yeah, yes. So then there's also the fact that, you know, the data that's coming out of this system could potentially be very useful uh, to people, right? Like you're talking about all the transactions that are happening in your system. We're talking about getting an observable view of what your system is doing. That sounds like that could be useful uh, to, to, to hackers um, and eavesdroppers. It's not Sometimes people look hear the term telemetry, and I, I've seen this happen on the internet. I don't quite get where it's coming from. I think it's coming from people not liking the fact that, you know, when you install your video game or or like a Microsoft product, like they want to get telemetry about their software out, and that can oh, be yeah. seen as like, oh, we're we're spying on you. And it's true. You could you could use this stuff to to spy on people but i don't i don't think telemetry systems are like a really great choice there i mean like like you can go buy like um spyware tools that that do spyware and, and run those uh better than hacking up an observability system into, <laughs> into spyware. But yeah, you should think about PII. You should think about what information is potentially getting leaked through this tool that you don't want leaked. And yep. uh, where is that information going? There's yep. maybe one extra thing with um, tracing, which is in band. You're sending some amount of information in band. And at some point that information may egress a trust boundary. So you may be talking to say some third party database over there and you're tracing in band tracing information, what's called trace context and baggage is just going to truck along with it. And so that potentially could be, could be a leak. So if you're a security person and you're looking at evaluating someone who's installed, uh, installed a tracing system, you want to look at where, what, systems are downstream from yours that are potentially out of your trust boundary. Um, you also might want to look at things like uh, how people can control or manipulate this observability system by, by sending it directives from the outside. But that's, that's really no different than, than you might say any other, any yeah. other system. You want to have yeah, your control point. plane locked down and, and yeah, and I think to your point, the standard logging logging um, kind of security risk would still apply. So, or yeah, that, identity, whatever you're exactly, doing over there, that, it's the same 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 stuff you're doing with logging today. That that hasn't that hasn't changed. Yeah. Way. Um. So, if someone wants to learn more about this, where can they get more information? Um. I'm, I'm I do want to get into the fun section, which is the last section. So, yeah. Quickly, uh, what's the um, if someone wants to learn more about open telemetry tracing observability, what's a good um uh, place to start and where can they find the resources for that? Yeah, so um, OpenTelemetry.io is the website for the project. Uh, we have a GitHub organization, OpenTelemetry, you know, Open-Telemetry on GitHub. Um, those are great places to start. There's a repo in that GitHub org called Community. The Community repo, the readme there, has all of the how to get in touch with us information there. So we, we have a lot of meetings we're a big fan of, of having face-to-face uh, -face meetings to discuss things. So the project itself is discussed on Zoom and on GitHub issues. So you can find the, the Google calendar there for when all our meetings are, our meetings are open. You can come to them, they're all recorded and put up on YouTube. So it's totally transparent, but anyone can come to these meetings. 
And we're also, we hang out on Slack. So we're part of the CNCF Slack instance. And if you go to that community repo, you can find the links to like how to join the Slack instance and you can say hi there. So those are the, the best places uh, to get a hold of us. And if you just go to the website or look at the repos, there's lots of getting started material. I work at Lightstep. Lightstep's an awesome company. We provide a lot of training material. So if you go to uh, the Lightstep uh, website, like otel.lightstep.com or opentelemetry.lightstep.com, we have training material there. I produce a lot of YouTube videos. So, um, uh, and they mostly get produced on Lightstep's YouTube channel. So if you go to Lightstep's YouTube channel, there's an open telemetry playlist there. And that's where you can find my content. And I have a lot of videos that are kind of like overview of, you know, here's the design and architecture of open telemetry. Here's how to get started with it. Here's like what the point of it is. Like, yep. here's what all these terms mean. So that's, that's like, if you like, uh, this video uh, format, uh, I recommend that. I think I've got the the most comprehensive set of video materials on the project. I'll definitely link that up in the show notes as well. So sure. uh, I know we've been talking about open telemetry observability for some time, and I did want to yeah. have uh, a few minutes for our fun section right in the end, which are non-technical questions just to get know, get to know Ted a bit better and uh, sure. your cat as well. Yeah. So, by the way, what's the cat's name? This is Penny. Hi, Penny. <laughs> yeah. Penny definitely wants attention. Yeah. Hey, Betty. Uh, she, she definitely cannot give attention right now to me, uh, but she's distracted by you, man. I'll say, uh, so just three questions, right, in the fun fun part. And mm -hmm. of course, um, what do, the first one being, what do you spend most time on when you're not working on cloud native or open telemetry? When I'm not working on open telemetry uh, and I'm not working on Lightstep, then... Yeah. Uh, uh, these days, it's a lot of uh, a lot of drawing, a lot of um, art. I used to be an animator before uh, switching over to internet stuff, and right. So lately, I've been getting back into that a bit. So some drawing, some painting. Uh, I don't. I post a little bit on Instagram, um, but uh, yeah, might be getting into writing some scripts soon. Uh, maybe filming a thing or two. So yeah. Wow. It's kinda... so, so you have a whole creative side to yourself as well. Uh -huh. Yeah, well, I mean, I say all this stuff is, is creative, honestly. I think there's a lot of creativity that goes into computer programming. Yeah, yeah, uh, cool. Um, I, I was going to say, de definitely we should uh, uh, look out for that movie script that comes out. Yeah, uh, sure. <laughs> second question, what is something that you're proud of, but not on your social media? Proud of that's not on my social media. So uh, I've got, I live on like a half acre here, and about half of that's cultivated. So we have like a little tiny farm in the back oh, right. and so that's kind of where i spend the rest of my time uh and i'm real proud of of this this setup we got going on over here so, so wow. just getting outside and and growing stuff that's uh that's that's where i'm at these days so what, what's the what what are you growing this season like what's the season for yeah this season we got a lot of i'm, I'm all about caprese I just love caprese so we're growing a lot of tomatoes and basil uh, we also got uh, three sisters going, which is when you take corn and beans and squash and we, you kind of grow them as a coherent unit. Um, oh, right. It's a, it's a traditional American way of, of growing, growing food. And um, it's uh, uh, so we've been doing a lot of that. Plus, we got, you know, some apples and plums and pears and things like that. Uh, a lot of berries. A lot of things got scorched. We had this insane heat dome where it got up to 115 degrees here, and it literally burnt a lot of the fruit. Like, like someone oh took God. a magnifying glass to it and just like yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so that that really thrashed a lot of uh, a lot of um, uh, horticulture up here in Oregon, unfortunately. So, so. Oh. Uh, the climate change stuff is a thing that I put a lot of effort into to like awareness there. That was how I actually got started on the internet was around doing work with the environmental movement to kind of help leverage the early days of the internet to kind of raise awareness. Cause this was, people know about it now, but if you actually roll back to like 2001, 2003, most people were like pretty clueless about this, they just literally hadn't heard about it. Uh, so uh, that was actually how I got into the internet was kind of advocacy around uh, Wait, raising you, you were one of the first people to start those conversations on the internet. 
Yeah, I mean, I want to say like the first, but yeah, very early on, um, working with a guy named Bill McKibben, uh, who's been around for a long time, and that started on college campuses is a thing called Step It Up, which then turned into uh, an organization called 350.org. And then that's now turned into what's called the Sunrise Movement. So there's sort of been like three generations of this. Uh, wow. But yeah, yeah, a lot, a, lot of, a lot of the early days of that stuff, um, the Keystone XL pipeline campaign and things like that. So people okay. have different opinions about this stuff, but I, I think that unfortunately we're now, we've been moving real slow on, on actually doing something about it, even though we know about it. And yeah. uh, certainly in Oregon, we're really starting to feel like some of the crazier effects as, as like the climate shifting kind of hits this sort of hockey stick curve. You're going to see a lot over the next decade, a lot of, just like really bizarre. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I know we won't get yeah. into this because, but, uh, yeah. but I, I, I'm agreeing with you. We definitely need to do a lot more work. I think Australia is very similar as well. You almost feel mm -hmm. like it should be doing a lot more, but you know, it's just uh, going to get weird. The next decade, <laughs> you're just going to see a lot of weird weather. Basically, it's going to be very bizarre. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, they were saying it was uh, the hottest day in Sweden, which is like a cold country or something. There was mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. things weirder things are happening. But yeah, I, I've got one more question for you, and I'll, uh, that'll be the end. Uh, what's your favorite cuisine or restaurant that you can share? Oh man, so many. Uh, I love ramen. Uh, I'm a big ramen right. fanatic. Um, I'm, I'm from Hawaii originally, so, so we had a lot of that growing up, and. Uh, um so yeah i'd throw that out there that's one of my faves awesome ramen. all right uh dude thanks so much for this i really appreciate that and i'm so glad we got to know the other side of uh, ted as well yeah yeah so where can people find you where, where do you normally hang out and if they have more questions about observability yeah best place to hit me up is on twitter so i'm ted suo on twitter uh i post links uh it's pretty low volume twitter account i mostly am posting links to conversations and material related to open telemetry. So that's a place to follow me if you're interested in the subject. My DMs are open, so you can always hit me up there. Otherwise, on the open telemetry Slack instance, just hop onto that Slack and uh, say hi there. Awesome. All right. I'll definitely encourage people to check uh, Ted out, and I'll definitely encourage people to check out observability and tracing as well. So awesome. th thanks so much for having uh, coming on the show, man. I really appreciate this, and uh, looking forward to ha having more conversations with you about this. Yeah, absolutely, man. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. All right, everyone. I'll see you next week.